<clears throat> okay, three, two, one. I was in the basement of the British Library a few years ago, and the person I was with asked if we would like to see the first time machine. Of course, I said. He led us to a shelf of Edison wax cylinders, some of the first recordings ever made. I know you were expecting something more sci-fi, he said, but each of these cylinders contains a continuous three-minute slice of a hundred-year-old time. And it's kind of true. These are time machines. Big bed, wet bit, London, striking, half past ten, a quarter to eleven, and eleven o'clock. July the 16th, 1890. <laughs> I never get tired of thinking that before Edison and the phonograph, nobody had ever heard the voice of a dead person. And nobody had ever heard a piece of music that wasn't being performed right in front of them. Today is May 30th, 2021. I am Pamela Z, and I am reading these words written by Sam Green about a piece of music John Cage wrote for Kronos Quartet. Through the magic of recording, you will be hearing these words in the future, in another time and place. Harvard Square, September 11th, 1971. These people are setting up for a performance by John Cage of his seminal work, 433. This event was staged for cameras and was part of a film Nam June Pike made called A Tribute to John Cage. I'm guessing most of you know about 433. But if you don't, it's a piece John Cage composed in 1952 that consists of a pianist or any musician for that matter, playing nothing for four minutes and 33 seconds. There are three movements. So the pianist starts and stops the stopwatch at various points and also opens and closes the piano. Here you can see Cage closing the piano to start the piece. And notice that stopwatch there. We'll come back to that later. The pianist never plays a note. The piece is the sounds all around, the stuff we would normally tune out. It's a revolutionary work, and there have been whole books written about it. But the thing that strikes me about 433 is that it insists on presentness. For these people in Harvard Square, on September 11th, 1971, they are listening in new and engaged ways to the sounds all around them. They are in the present moment in a radical way. But what about you? You are watching a recording of people being present. You can't quite be in Harvard Square with John Cage. And you can't be fully in your own place with the sounds around you there. You are in some weird nether place. I've been looking everywhere for the original 16 millimeter film shot on this day. What you are seeing here is a bad video transfer dubbed down several generations and finally turned into a digital file. I imagine that the original footage would be luminous, the kind of thing that would make your heart flutter. But it's lost, or it seems to be lost. No one even knows who really owns these images. This is an orphan slice of time.
In the Kronos Archive in San Francisco, I came across this, a notogram from John Cage. Cage was a huge fan of the notogram and mailed out hundreds, if not thousands, of them over the years. It's funny how he used the notogram, kind of how we would text or email. I'm looking forward to working with the quartet here on the 24th, he writes. By the way, I have no music stands. This was in preparation for a rehearsal of 30 pieces for string quartet. There was a message on the answering machine that was from John saying, oh, well, I have this piece and if you, you know, that I've written for you guys and if you would like the piece, you know, I think it was a $2,000 fee or something. Of course we want it. <laughs> and so it, he wrote this piece and it was, um, it was called 30 Pieces for String Quartet. Someone had the idea, wouldn't it be cool to do, do this piece in Cage and Merce Cunningham's apartment. And that sounded great to me. I thought it'd be great. And so uh, eventually we were there and we were doing it and there was a film crew filming this. And, and as I recall, Cage was uh, sitting by his telephone writing a new piece and you know, if the phone rang, he would answer it. And we were playing, <laughs> I was, I, all I remember is I was in the kitchen. I don't distinguish between uh, uh, music and noise. I'm interested in all sounds. He wrote it all by chance, by throwing the I Ching. So every note, you know, was determined by the I Ching, every nuance, and, and even if you put the bow on the string before you play, or you put it, drop it, you know, etc. The viola part is one of the hardest viola parts I've ever played. He was talking about the piece and he said, you know, just by chance the viola part became really, really dense. And, <laughs> and then he would giggle about it, you know. It's also one of those pieces that you play from different parts of the auditorium. So like I, I played it on a balcony, you know, where someone else is on stage, you know, and someone else is on another area. And so the, the whole listening experience is completely different for the audience. Cage's uh, quartet for Kronos is made up of 30 short sections, 30 movements. And we each start a stopwatch, ideally at exactly the same moment. You disregard everybody else when you're playing, and you only play to your stopwatch. And so you can play it your minute piece, I think in 30 seconds, or, or a minute and 30 seconds. And the, the idea is that they overlap, so the piece will never sound the same twice. And we're all following the watch, the piece is exactly 30 minutes, it's over at 30 minutes. Kronos performed this piece, 30 Pieces for String Quartet, about 20 times between the 80s and the early 2000s. It's not entirely clear where and when this particular recording was made. Was Hank in the balcony that evening? Was John playing from the wings? 
There's so much about 30 Pieces for String Quartet that can't be captured in a recording. It, too, insists on presentness. There are certain people that are in contact with the elemental qualities of what it means to be a musician. I would say John Cage is one of those people. You know, what is music? I mean, I ask myself that question every day. You know, you finish making a note and that's it. You know, where is it? I mean, I, I've decided where it is, is it's in, inside of whoever happened to hear it. This is John Cage's stopwatch. It's not just the same model or a similar stopwatch. It's the stopwatch, his stopwatch. The stopwatch was given to him by his father, who got it in the army. It's the same stopwatch we saw him using here. And the same stopwatch you can see him wrestling with here. This is 1990, the last time Kronos performed with him. David remembers that the stopwatch didn't work. Cage performed the piece anyway and laughed about it later. I've always loved the crisp sound of a stopwatch. But there's something about the inexorable passing of time that gets me. John Cage died on August 12, 1992. Today is May 30th, 2021. I am Pamela Z, and I am reading these words written by Sam Green about a piece of music John Cage wrote for Kronos Quartet in 1983. 